Good morning. Yeah, it works. All right, so it's 10.45. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, this session is going to be sort of a, a fire hose of things that I wish someone had told me when I first got it started doing Drupal development. Um, I've spent a lot of years teaching people um, how to do Drupal development, and so I have a lot of tips and stuff that I've kind of collected from that. But I've also spent a lot of time building websites with Drupal, and I've learned a lot along the way. Um, and we'll talk about that and sort of my background a little bit. Um, my name is Joe Schindelar, um, or EOJ the Brave, on Drupal.org, Twitter, pretty much everything on the internet. Um, I chose this handle when I was in like high school, and then it was awesome for a couple of years, and now I'm like, oh, I wish I had chosen like Joe Schindelar or something as my handle. It'd be a lot easier. Um, I currently work for a company called Lullabot. Um, Lullabot does a a lot of Drupal work. We do Drupal consulting, uh, we do training around Drupal, we build Drupal websites, pretty much anything Drupal related or in really web related that you need help with, we can do that. Um, and then I also, uh, one of my primary duties at Lullabot is working on the Drupalize.me website, uh, which is a site that has a bunch of uh, Drupal training videos. Um, and they uh, gratefully allowed me to be here today and speak about training and Drupal and getting to know Drupal better. Um, so yeah, that's me. Um, so just sort of a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we've got like 45 minutes, give or take a little bit. I'd like to leave some time for question and answer at the end. But this is kind of what we're going to talk about. Um, why this session is important or why I think this was a good idea. We're going to talk about some of the like jargon or different terms that are important to know when you're getting to know Drupal. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about I'm new to Drupal and some tips and tricks for finding modules. Uh, for me, this was something that was really, it took a while to figure out, like there's a, about a billion modules out there, and it took a while for me to figure out how do I find the ones in this pile of crap that don't totally suck. Um, we'll talk a bit about setting up a local development environment and why that's important. Some trip tricks that I learned about doing that. Um, and then there's a section of this presentation that is literally like a fire hose of me being like, oh yeah, I remember when I made that mistake. You probably don't want to do that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Drupal community and why that's important in getting involved with the community. Um, and then have some time for Q&A. If you've only got five minutes and you would rather be off getting coffee or using the restroom or whatever it is you need to do this morning, um, stick around for this slide. This is what you're going to learn from this presentation. You're going to learn that when you're learning Drupal, Google is your best friend. Um, you can search for just about anything you need to know about Drupal, and somebody out there has probably solved that problem or something similar already. The trick is knowing what to search for when you search Google or Drupal.org or any of the other available assets. Um, and that's kind of what this presentation will be about, is giving you some of the terms and knowledge that you need in order to search for things and find the answers that you're looking for. If you're looking for an answer, the answer to your question is probably, there's a module for that. And the module that you're probably looking for is called Views. Um, there you go, ta-da. You need to know everything you need to know about building sites with Drupal. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that concept. Um, and then we're, we'll talk a lot about sort of how I learned about Drupal through working with the community and this idea that Drupal is an open source project where um, I can basically copy and paste things that other people have done in order to learn how to do things um, that I need to do and some of how I solve some of my problems doing that. So that's my five minute pitch. You need to know how to use Google. You need to know what to look for. You probably need to look for views. Um, and if views doesn't do it, just copy and paste something that somebody else did because it's open source after all. The hardest thing about getting started with Drupal or any other like new thing that you're trying to learn is that you don't know what you don't know. And that's what makes it hard to find the answers. When you first come to Drupal, you're like, all right, this is great. I'm going to build a website, and I need to add some content to my site. But I don't know how to add content to my site. So you start searching Google. How do I add content to a Drupal site? 
Da, da, da. Finally, you stumble across the word node, and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I need to create a node to add content to my site. But there's all these terms that we don't know, um, and it makes it hard to find the answers that we're looking for. In addition to not knowing terms, too, there's just a lot of basic concepts that you kind of stumble across. Um, when you're learning these things by yourself, I did a lot of my early Drupal development essentially in a black box. Uh, I didn't get myself involved with the community. I worked for a, a small design company, but I was the only developer there. I spent all of my time sitting in the cubicle, not talking to anybody else, uh, and learning Drupal, um, sort of. Later on, I got involved with the community, and I learned that I had actually learned to do a lot of things the wrong way, and spent a lot of time undoing the things that I had previously learned um, in order to kind of do them the, the correct way. But it was sort of this, I didn't really know that I was doing it the wrong way, because I had no idea that there was a different way to do it. Um, so I said we'd talk a little bit about some of the jargon or different terms that I think are important for people that are getting started with Drupal and things that I wish I had kind of understood a little bit better when I first got started with Drupal. Um, granted, I got started with Drupal about six years ago. Um, the first site I built with Drupal, I downloaded a copy of Drupal 3 and attempted to install it. At that time, you got a, a, a .sql file that contained all of everything for Drupal and you and there was no like installer you just you know imported the SQL file and great you've got a Drupal site now um, and I started to build the site and I said this is terrible so I deleted the site and I built it with Mambo instead and it looked really flashy uh, and then I had to edit the code and I realized this is terrible um, and kind of went back and forth between those two systems for a while then I gave up on that and started writing my own because I was like, sweet, I learned enough PHP and MySQL from hacking on Drupal and Mambo that I could write my own system. So I started writing my own system. And then at some point, I was basically just copying and pasting things wholesale out of the user module from Drupal because I was like, this is great. They do this really well. And then I was like, maybe I should just use that system. And I ended up coming back to Drupal in like four or five and, and made a lot of progress since then. Um, and so some of the terminology and the way things that are done has changed a lot since then, but it's still like important concepts to know. In Drupal, there's this concept of Drupal core and contrib. Um, and so Drupal core is you go to Drupal, you download the current version of Drupal. In this case, it's Drupal 7 dot something. Um, you go to the project page, you download it, you get the zip file, you unzip it. Everything inside of that zip file is Drupal core. Um, and, and kind of keeping that straight. There are different things in Drupal core. There are themes that are part of Drupal core, and there are modules that are part of Drupal core. But understanding, like, I've downloaded this zip file, and that is the piece of it that is core when people talk about it. Um, Drupal core itself is both some modules that provide basic functionality, um, and also just a library of functions and tools for developers to use in order to create their own modules and add additional functionality. And then there's Drupal contrib. Contrib is pretty much anything else you download from Drupal.org that isn't Drupal core. So additional modules that you plug into Drupal to extend its functionality, themes that enhance how Drupal looks, that kind of stuff is all Drupal contrib. Uh, and kind of keeping those things straight. We'll talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. Uh, there's the ubiquitous term in Drupal, node, which kind of means a lot of things in Drupal and a lot of different things. Um, when I first got started with Drupal, I had this idea that I wanted to create pages. And I would think a page is like the top corner of the website where the home button and the logo is, all the way to the bottom right corner where the you know, copyright line is. And I was like, I want to create one of these, a page. But there wasn't really a way to do that. And um, sort of kind of understanding the concept of nodes. And you could create a node that was a page. Um, and then this idea of nodes sort of just kept getting more and more complicated, basically. Um, the more versions of Drupal that we've gone through. Today, for me, a node is primarily a piece of content on my site. Um, it's not necessarily a page in the sense that it's not the logo in the top right corner all the way down to the copyright line in the bottom right, um, but it's the primary piece of content on that page. So I might be viewing an article on my site, and the page is the entire web page, but the node is just the article portion of that. So the title of the article, the body, copy, the image that goes with it. Um, and then in, in Drupal 7, we kind of took this concept of nodes and abstracted it even further. Um, and we've now got what are called entities. And this is where it gets really confusing, uh, but important to know. So 
Basically, nodes or entities in Drupal combined with fields are Drupal's system for doing some kind of data mapping, for creating the schema that will eventually become your website. When I first started building sites with Drupal, I essentially tried to create a node for like every single page on my site. And I would do like, I would create a bunch of articles that were nodes, and then I would create another node that was a list of all the articles that I just created, and I'd link to them. Um, and it was sort of, every page on my site was one individual node. And I later realized that um, I could use a node as sort of a basic um, type of data, uh, and you could have various types of nodes, so an article node, a, a page node. When it became really powerful for me was when I started to understand I could do things like have a node that wasn't necessarily a piece of content that someone would read, but rather data that Drupal could use in order to map different pieces of the site together. So a good example of that is um, you, you tend to think of nodes or content on your site as being like a page or an article. But there's also like um, a staff biography some, or, an, or an author profile on your site. And I started to get this understanding that I could create an author's profile as a node um, and then link that to the article and sort of create these relationships. Um, so nodes or entities are your sort of basic data type and then fields are what is used to enhance the data model. If you think of an entity as basically just a blank shell that's like, okay, I can start putting information here and then you can use fields to sort of create a schema for that data. Um, so for an article, the example would be you might have a field for the title, you might have a field for the body, you might have a field for the person that authored this article, which is actually a, a reference to another entity, which is a author profile. Um, so you start using all of this to create these maps of, how, of the data on your site. That was a really important concept for me to figure out early on in Drupal. Um, so that's nodes. Um, another one that we often see is blocks. Um, this also I think can get a little bit confusing because in some ways blocks are, are content as well but I tend to think of blocks as being either like secondary content, things that I'd like to be able to reuse across a number of different pages um, or even more than that I often think of blocks as kind of just being a really simple way to lay out things on a page. Basically like take this piece of content and put it here. I might have a block that has a node inside of it um, but basically think of a block as a reusable widget that you can place somewhere on the page inside of a region in Drupal and it will contain some kind of content. Modules of course um, you'll hear this term a lot. There's a module for that. Um, got a problem? There's probably a module for that. Um, modules are um, pieces of code that extend the Drupal core functionality. This is a little bit misleading because there's actually modules in Drupal core, like the node module, for example, or the user module are part of Drupal core. Uh, but then most of what you'll, where you'll get modules is from contrib. Um, modules extend Drupal core's functionality by implementing what are called hooks. Um, so another common term in Drupal that's sort of one of those, once you're into Drupal, you'll be like, oh yeah, hook, you use a hook for that. When you first get started with Drupal, you're like, all right, I need to write some code. How do I do that? Uh, probably by implementing a hook. Um, modules are used to extend Drupal's functionality or to alter its existing functionality. Um, it kind of like you, you always hear that people say, there's an app for that. Um, you know, I want to, I want to figure out how to take the train somewhere in Munich. There's probably an app for that. Um, in Drupal, you'll always hear, there's a module for that. Um, another common term is themes. Themes are basically the HTML and CSS that make your site look the way that it looks. Um, uh, another term that is used a lot in Drupal is the word <coughs> path. Uh, and this gets used in a lot of different contexts. The uh, one that it, I think, um, has the most value in is thinking of the path as part of the URL. So if you think of um, a URL for your site, it's mysite.com slash about. Um, Drupal thinks of the path as everything that comes after the sort of top level domain part. So everything after example.com slash, Drupal considers that a path. And it uses that path in order to map all of Drupal's sort of flow. So when you go to a specific path, it knows which module to invoke, what code to call in that module, eventually which content to display on the page and so forth. Um, so that's what sort of the path does primarily. Um, paths in Drupal have the ability to be changed, so you can essentially set up an alias for a path. 
And so you'll see this a lot where I want to create a about page. Um, when I create that page, it ends up with a path by default that sort of Drupal's internal reference for that piece of content or node that I just created that might be node slash two. But then I can create a path alias for that path that allows me to say about the path about is exactly the same as node slash two. And what Drupal will do is when I go to view that page at slash about, internally it'll actually just replace the query string uh, for about with the path of the actual node itself. And from then on, inside of Drupal and all the code that runs will just be like, oh, you're talking about the path that is node slash two. Uh, when in the browser is like, oh, slash about, this is great, thank you. Um, so paths are become an important term. Um, and I, I thought that this one is a good to bring up because initially I would always think of paths as the URL. So I'm always searching for like, how do I modify the URL? Um, how do I change the URL of this page? But it turns out what I really wanted to change was the path. Um, tokens are another important concept um, in Drupal that ends up coming up a lot when you're first getting in building sites with Drupal. Tokens are basically little um, tokens or sort of variables that you can place into text in different form fields within Drupal that then get dynamically replaced with some sort of variable content. A good example of that would be you wanted to have a, a block on your site or, or you know maybe an email that gets sent out when somebody, yeah, this is a good example. Drupal sends out an email when you register for an account on a site. That email is configured from a screen in the administrative interface where you enter in a bunch of text and you can put tokens into that text. And the token might be something like the email address of the u person that just signed up for an account. So there's a token for like user colon email that will be dynamically replaced with my email address when I sign up. But then these tokens can get a lot more advanced. They can do things like say the username of the currently logged in user um, or you know the current date and time. Um, I use this for, you always have to put that copyright in the bottom, right? It's like copyright 2012, but then every year you have to go and update it so that it's relevant. Just put a token in there that gets automatically replaced with today's the date, and you're like, all oh, right, I'm always up to date. Uh, but tokens are basically just little um, snippets that you can put into text. They don't work in every form field in Drupal, um, but they work in a lot of them, and when they do, they'll say next to that text area, um, it'll basically give you a list uh, of all the tokens that you can use within it if you have the token module installed. This is a little bit confusing because the system that allows for this token replacement is built into Drupal 7. Um, but the UI or the interface that allows you to see what tokens are available still lives in contrib. Um, so that was one of those like aha moments. It's like if I install this other module, it exposes all of this additional functionality in Drupal that I didn't know was there sort of under the scenes before. Uh, another important um, term or thing to understand with Drupal jargon is IRC. Um, IRC, I eventually found out, stands for Internet Relay Chat. I initially thought IRC was kind of this scary place where people hung out and talked about arrays and, and SQL and that kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm going to stay away from there. That doesn't sound like my kind of thing. But really what it is, is it's just a big chat room. Um, it's sort of the digital equivalent of what's going on right here. Um, everyone's in a room, it would be very easy to sort of raise your hand and ask a question. It's easy to ask, uh, to talk to somebody, you can address them directly and so forth. Um, it was a, a big revelation for me was essentially getting comfortable with logging into IRC and asking a question or just talking to people. I logged in for years before I ever spoke up or said anything in the pound Drupal chat room on IRC. I just hung out there and lingered and people would ask questions and I'd be like, oh, I know the answer to that. And then I'd be like, oh man, I wonder how I solved this problem. And I'd sit there and stare at IRC and watch other people ask their questions and scroll by. And then I'd go try to Google my problem and figure it out. And eventually I was like, wait, I'm actually supposed to ask people these questions. Um, that was a huge thing for me getting involved with Drupal. And it actually, um, unfortunately, this is one of those things that took me a couple of years to figure out. Um, I, like I said, I basically spent the first couple of years of my Drupal career working in a black box. Um, and I eventually, for me it was a courage thing. I knew about IRC, um, I knew about sort of the community and that they're all, everyone was out there. But I kept thinking, I had this idea that um, I couldn't ask my questions or talk to people until I was good enough at Drupal to be respected. Um, I'm not, I don't, 
I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest. Uh, but I, it kind of goes along those lines. And eventually I just kind of went, well, I think I'm good enough now. Um, and I distinctly remember the first time I asked, asked a question about Drupal. It was actually on the forum. I was like, all right, I got this. Um, I can ask an intelligent question. Um, I asked a question about some PHP code, and I was like, yeah, I totally got this. It'll be no problem. Um, the first like five replies to my comment were like, this is the worst code. This is like totally the wrong way to do it. I'm like, oh, OK. So then I disappeared again for another like six months or so. I was like, <laughs> screw that. Um, these guys are scary. Um, eventually, though, I, I realized that there were things to learn from that interaction. It, like, yes, whoever made those responses could have done so in a nicer way and not said, this is stupid. Um, they could have said, this isn't the best way to do it. Here's another way. And I went back and I started to look at those conversations that I had had with people, and I realized that I could learn a lot from them. Um, you know, I have a, one of my earliest uh, interactions with any like one individual from the Drupal community was again, in it, this time it was an IRC, and I was trying to figure out how to solve a problem with displaying a um, basically a, a plural string that. Um, when you've got one member, you have to write the word member. But when you have two members, you have to pluralize it and add, basically add an S. So it now it says members instead of member. And I was having trouble figuring out some logic around that. And I posted an IRC and um, <clears throat> was kind of like, hey, I got this solution. Does this seem right to you guys? And um, Nate Haug, who I now work with and is a good friend, was like, ah, actually, that's totally wrong. Um, I mean, it works. But you really don't need 20 lines of code to do that. Just call this function. Uh, turns out Drupal has a built-in function, format underscore plural, that lets you pluralize words and not have to do anything other than give it a number and the uh, like count, and then the two words that you'd like to use. I had no idea that this existed. I spent probably a couple hours trying to figure out how to make this work for me. Somebody else comes along and says, oh, just call this function. It was awesome. Um, since then, and, and sort of in more recent times, um, I've found that a lot of conversation about Drupal is starting to happen on Twitter as well. And that's become a really useful tool for me. Um, I follow a lot of people on Twitter that are also doing Drupal work. Um, and it's nice because I can learn information that I might not have known I wanted to know just by kind of following those Twitter streams and seeing, you know, um, so and so is talking about this new module, and so and so is talking about this thing that they just figured out how to do. And I kind of file that away as sort of periphery information. But it's nice because I know a little bit of knowledge now. So when it comes time for me to solve that problem, I can be like, yeah, I remember somebody else was solving that. And here's some of the words that I kind of remember. So now I know what to Google for. Um, so I highly recommend um, following other Drupal people on Twitter. It's also a nice place to just sort of ask those questions, too. Like, um, does anybody know if there is a module that performs this task? Does anybody know of a format that lets me Easily, or a, a function that will let me easily pluralize words. Um, so that's some of my basic jargon. One of the things with Drupal is that there are a ton of um, terms that I often feel like we're just sort of made up. Like someone was like, well, we need to call this piece of code something. Let's call it node. Like, OK. Um, and, and sort of figuring that out that those things exist. Um, I, I can't go through all of them here. Drupal.org has a good glossary. Uh, it's actually huge, and there's a lot of terms in it that are like, yep, I totally know what the internet is. Uh, you don't need to have that in here. Um, but there's also some really good information in there as well. OK, so after you've kind of like done your Google search and you figured out, here's my problem, here's what I need to do, um, you need to pick modules. Um, early on, when I first got started with Drupal, picking the module to do something was really easy. All you did was download an entire CVS checkout of the contrib repository and go to the modules page and turn all the modules on and then just see if one of them does what you need it to. And it was awesome. Uh, you could look at all, there was you know, maybe like a few hundred modules at that time. Now there's like, I, there's a pile ton of modules. I don't actually know how many there are, um, but I'm guessing it's roughly 1.6 billion at this point. Um, there's a ton of code in Drupal Contrib. The tricky part is that code is in all sorts of various states of complete and various states of usefulness. And so one of the things that I had to learn how to do early on was figure out how do I sort of figure out where is the needle in this haystack? 
And so I have some things that I kind of, along the road, figured out. One of them was this um, being comfortable talking to people in the community. So by far the best way to figure out what module is going to help solve your problem is ask someone. Find someone that you trust and ask them. Ask an IRC. Um, ask someone in the room at, at, at a conference like this. Um, there are so many modules out there that it's, it's pretty much impossible for one individual to go through and evaluate every single one. And so the best and surest way to find out about other ones is ask people that maybe have looked at one that you haven't. It doesn't necessarily mean talking to an individual person either. There are a lot of sources for um, figuring out sort of what's out there that aren't people but could still be entities in a sense that you trust. Um, at Lullabot, we do a module Monday. So every Monday on the lullabot.com blog, um, we post about a new module that someone at Lullabot has used recently and said, hey, this was useful for this particular task. Um, I work with everybody at Lullabot. Uh, I know them pretty well. I trust most of them. Um, and so depending, so if the module comes up from that source, I'll pro probably trust that it's going to work and do what I need it to and, and so forth. Um, part of what you're dealing with is with all these modules is like they're third-party code. They're written by someone that you don't know. They've been uploaded to Drupal.org. Pretty much anyone can write code and upload it to Drupal.org. There's a process that you have to go through to get an account. Um, it takes a long time uh, and it's kind of tedious, but pretty much anyone can get an account. Once you've got an account, you can just go ahead and start creating projects on Drupal.org. Um, and so you end up with a lot of modules that are things like I had a particular problem that I needed to solve for Joe's awesome website about unicorns. Uh, I needed a, a, a module for counting number of horns on unicorns and it was really useful for my website. I wrote the code, I uploaded it to Drupal.org and it's great. Um, there's this module up there and you can use it. And it solved my problem really well, but it maybe didn't solve other problems. There, the code it may be buggy. Um, it may be totally worked for my one scenario, but maybe full of flaws for something else. It may be full of security problems and so forth. It, so it's important to remember that code on, in Drupal Contrib is added by essentially people that you don't know. And so being able to evaluate and figure out which of this should I trust is important. Searching Drupal.org, um, you can now on Drupal.org, you've been able to do this for a while, but you can order by the most installed when you perform a search, uh, one of the facets that you could use when searching is order this list by most installed. Um, and one of the things that I eventually learned about this most installed is that it's not actually, I initially assumed this was just like a download count. So you click, every time somebody downloaded views, it was like, hey, somebody downloaded views. It must be more installed than other things that are less downloaded. It turns out that this, is act, this most installed is actually pulled from um, Drupal, which will if you allow it to, we'll phone home uh, periodically and say, here's a list of all the modules that are on this site and which version and so forth. It uses that in order to check for its security updates, but one of the side effects of that is that, like maybe side benefits, we'll say. One of the side benefits of that is that Drupal.org has a pretty good idea of how many sites out there are using any particular module. So that can be useful in evaluating, because uh, it, most likely, if a module has a lot of installs and a lot of people using it, it probably does what it says it's going to do, and it probably does it well. Uh, once you find a module, um, the page looks something like this. There's a bunch of information on it. Um, this, one of the things you'll see for, for a module is this list of like recommended releases and what you're going to download. Um, I initially was always I would come here and I would download whatever was in the green line. Uh, every single time, hands down, I would download whatever was the recommended release. Um, I would download and install that. And I would just stay far away from everything else. Uh, thinking that just because it's in red or in yellow means I shouldn't or couldn't use that. Um, but later realized that that's not necessarily always the case. And this is a really good example. Um, this is for the, the views module. And you've got two um, versions for, well, you've actually got three versions here for Drupal 6. The 2.16, this 3.0, which is in yellow, and then the dev version down here. And my initial reaction to this was always like, use the one under recommended releases, 2.16. I would use that and stick to it, and I would just kind of stay away from the other ones. Um, but now, like, there's this 3.0 version of views um, for Drupal 6. It's listed under other releases, and so I kind of was like, well, that must be there for a reason, but I don't know what that reason is. And um, 
the reason that it's there is because this is something else that you may need or want to check out. Um, you don't necessarily need to just stick to the green or recommended release for any particular module. Um, try out the other releases. In this case, like the 3.0 version of views is pretty different than the uh, 2.16 version. And actually, um, it turns out it makes the process of, if you've got a Drupal 6 site, upgrading to Drupal 7 a lot easier if you're using the 3.0 version of views for Drupal 6. Initially, I would have just stayed away from that. Another thing that I learned too was um, sometimes development versions of a module um, actually contain fixes for things or new features that I need for my site that I didn't, that weren't there initially. And I sort of stayed away from these a lot. And then I kind of learned it was okay to download and, and start using a development release with that understanding that what you were doing was downloading and using some code that the person that maintains the code hadn't totally signed off on yet and said, this is an official release. Which I think is an important thing to keep in mind when looking at these module pages is that every single module on Drupal.org has a maintainer. Um, and that maintainer, um, well, so the example here is project information. It's things like maintenance status, development status, so like what's the status of this module. As a module maintainer, I can click edit on this page and I can change maintenance status to whatever I want to change it to. And so my definition of actively maintained may be very different than somebody else's definition of actively maintained. So keeping that in mind, there is no metric running in the background saying, oh, there were X number of commits in the last you know, 24 hours. This project must be actively maintained. No, this is just somebody checking a checkbox. Um, and if it's one of my modules, I probably checked the checkbox like two years ago and then never came back to that page again. So it's actively maintained because I checked that checkbox, but I actually haven't been back in a long time. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, we talked a little bit about like IRC and the community and that and so, so forth and sort of asking people that you trust about modules. Another good way to evaluate a module is look at who, who's worked on that module. Is the person that's worked on this someone that I trust? Um, if it's a, you know, a module written by someone like Merlin of Chaos in this case, um, he's written obviously views, which everyone uses, and so I go, oh, if you wrote another module, it's probably fairly useful, um, and it probably works pretty well, because I know views works well and is well maintained, and so you can sort of start to create these um, ideas, of, or sort of figure out which modules are going to be better than others uh, based on who wrote the module. Um, another thing that I, I learned was, I used to, if you see down at the very bottom of this box that says bug reports, 692 um, open bugs. I used to come and look at this page and I would be like, oh man, the views module has 692 bugs. There is no way I am downloading installing that module. Um, like that's 692 known problems with the code. Um, eventually I learned that 692 bugs and just looking at that number by itself wasn't really a good metric. And it gives you some idea that there's a lot of known problems. But you also have to understand that all of those bugs aren't necessarily bugs. Like somebody maybe filed a bug report that wasn't actually a bug. Like, you know, they maybe said, this word, you spelled the word the wrong and, and filed a bug report to fix it, where it's not necessarily a bug that's going to affect the performance of the module on my site. Uh, you also need to do things like look at the number of bugs total, in this case, like 6,500. Uh, so that kind of it becomes a better metric there. I can see there's almost 700 open, but there's 6,000 of them that have been solved already. So that's a nice metric of like, hey, someone's actually working on this and fixing the problems. Um, so my tip there was don't run away just because the module has bugs. Um, a, they might not really be bugs. B, the bug might not affect whatever you're trying to do with the module. It may be over in some little dark corner that you're not using at all. Um, and then it can just be a nice metric for that. Um, Sometimes the best solution is not one specific module, but it's actually a bunch of modules. I used to uh, search for modules on Drupal.org and it's like, okay, I need to build a photo gallery on my site. Um, so I'd start searching for the photo gallery module. And I'd eventually find Joe's awesome photo gallery module. And I'd download it and I'd install it and it would build Joe's awesome photo gallery module. And it kind of worked. Uh, or it worked well enough and it gave me a photo gallery, but it wasn't exactly what I was looking for. So then I'd go in and I'd start modifying the code for the module. 
I'd make it do what I needed it to do. You know, maybe I needed the photos to pop up in a little light box. So I'd make those changes and I'd submit a patch and the module maintainer would be like, well, thanks, but no, because on my site, the photo gallery looks like this and things don't pop up in a light box. So thanks for the patch, but no. Uh, so now I was using a module and I had to maintain this all this hacked code. One of the things that I it actually took me a long time to figure out in Drupal was this concept of um, modules that all worked and played together in order to build a greater solution. Uh, Views is a really good example of this and then in conjunction with things like the field system. Um, but this idea of a lot of separate modules that play together nicely in order to allow me to build a photo gallery. And then it can get a little bit tricky to figure that out because now I'm no longer searching for photo gallery. What I'm searching for is module that lets me make a list of things, module that lets me resize images and, and twist them around, module that lets me display things in a pop-up box. Um, but for me, having that understanding that if I could take the idea of what I'm trying to build and break it down a little bit, um, then and search for sort of each of those individual components, sometimes, not always, that would work better. My suggestion would be um, whenever you can in Drupal, build a solution using tools like views um, and fields and sort of the piecing it together method versus the downloading one giant module that does everything. I tend to go the um, build it myself route because then I can build exactly what I want to build rather than whatever someone else thought a photo gallery should look like. Uh, and finally, just download and test some modules. Um, you're, you know, you start searching, it, your search result returns 10 different modules that all do essentially the same thing. Uh, at the end of the day, download it, uh, turn it on. If it does what you need it to do, that's awesome. You should use that module. Um, one of the things that I, I sort of figured out doing development was the importance of being able to test modules um, in a place that was not my live website. Um, and this is interesting, you know, back when I first started doing Drupal, you uh, downloaded the code, you installed it. For me, it was I would download the module to my local, I would upload it to my server using FTP, and then I'd turn the module on and see what happens. Uh, and it sometimes worked, and it sometimes didn't. Uh, and that was what ended up biting me, was the it sometimes didn't work. Um, but, so I would, I told you, I, I worked in a black box learning this stuff. Um, but I, the only way that I knew how to sort of turn a module on was get it in, into the Drupal site and you turn it on and I didn't know anything about setting up a server or so forth so I just had the web server and would upload things and for the most part it worked great. Every once in a while you'd come across the module that was just totally busted. Uh, you know, maybe it has like an error in the PHP and all of a sudden I've turned on this module that keeps me from getting to my site at all and turning anything on or off and you're pretty much screwed. Um, so when you're doing this process, um, set up a local development environment. What turns out is actually really easy these days. Um, the, there's a bunch of ways to do it. Um, probably the easiest way at the moment to get started with Drupal 7 is to download the Acquia dev desktop. Um, you just go to their site, download the dev desktop. It's a one-click install. Um, it sets up all of the MySQL, Apache, PHP stuff that is necessary in order to run a Drupal site. And then it asks you, would you like to create a Drupal 7 site? And you're like, heck yeah, I would. And what would you like the admin user to be? And you're like, oh, I'd like it to be admin. What would you like the password to be? Well, I'd like it to also be admin. Um, go. And then 30 seconds later, you've got a Drupal 7 site that you can start installing modules on and playing around with. Um, if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, there's a lot of other options, um, MAMP and WAMP. Um, Mac Apache MySQL PHP or Windows Apache MySQL PHP or LAMP which is Linux Apache MySQL PHP. Um, there are a lot of solutions out there for sort of a one click install to get a development environment set up which means there is absolutely no reason that you should be testing things on anything other than your local development environment. Um, I kind of learned that the hard way. Um, so this part is kind of the, the fire hose of like, I was trying to come up with what are all the things that I totally messed up when I started learning Drupal? Um, so get ready, this is it. You spent a lot of time finding a module and you needed to download it and test it out or install it on your site. Um, 
When you download modules and install them on your Drupal site, put them in the sites all modules directory, not in that nice shiny directory that says modules right in Drupal's root directory. Uh, you can put them there and they will totally work. Um, and then you can put more of them in there and it'll totally work and it'll keep working. Um, there's nothing preventing you from doing it. The problem comes when it, it's time to upgrade later or when you need to figure out like which of these modules are Drupal core and which are ones that I downloaded. Which of this code is something that I wrote myself. Um, I learned that keeping things organized was really, really important. Um, when you first start, it's like you've downloaded Drupal core and it's all nicely organized, but pretty soon you're adding a bunch of additional things to it. And being able to keep track of what you added um, so, thing, and then also within what I've added, is it something that I got somewhere else from Drupal Contrib, for example, or is it something that I wrote myself uh, became really important. Um, so put all of your modules not in the root modules directory inside of the sites all modules directory, or same with themes and so forth. Uh, another common practice is inside of the modules directory, you can actually um, create any level of nested directories inside of that. As long as, so Drupal will basically find sites all modules and then just scan through it recursively until it finds code that it can load and do something with. So creating a directory for contrib and a directory for custom is really common practice. Um, and sometimes I'll even go beyond that and break it up into like uh, even more nested structure, but it helps me keep things organized. Um, another thing that I learned about Drupal was that if it's not working, it's probably the cache. Um, so a, a really, really good step uh, for debugging any problem with Drupal is, um, well, okay, so the first step is make sure that you're not actually just refreshing a screenshot of the website, because I've done that. Um, you change the CSS, refresh, refresh, nothing happens. You change it again, refresh, refresh. What is going on? Clear the cache, nothing happens. Ah! Uh, so make sure you're not refreshing a, a JPEG of the site. After that, um, Drupal has this concept of a, a cache that it uses for all kinds of different um, things and so clearing the cache can a lot of times clear up some of either these little problems that you're kind of like this didn't exist an hour ago when I was trying to figure this out or just before I installed this module like I can't quite figure it out what's going on here always start with clearing the cache um, and this will do things like clear out Drupal's um, cache of like no, the modules that it knows about and that are enabled. It'll clear out its CSS and JavaScript caches. It'll clear out its list of all the known paths in Drupal. It'll clear out its list of all of the um, values for replacing tokens. Um, so a lot of these things that are sort of um, important to the way Drupal works get cached so that it doesn't have to do it over and over and, and clearing that out can help a lot. Um, keeping your code up to date is really important. Uh, you downloaded Drupal core. Uh, you download, you know, 7.16. Uh, eventually, 7.18 comes out, and you need to install that. Or you've got a version of some module, and a new version comes out. Um, you need to update that. This is really important to do. But it's not like life or death. I need to do this uh, as soon as the new module comes out. I used to think that any time a new version of Drupal came out, I needed to stay up all night and update every single one of the sites that I was responsible for, uh, which at the time, like the company that I worked for had a lot of smaller sites. And so this would be like, you know, all right, Drupal 6.5 came out, I've got to spend the next 24 hours updating every single one of these sites, and I need to do it right now, otherwise they'll probably catch on fire. Um, but the truth is, they probably won't catch on fire, and you don't always need to do it right now. Uh, and that was an important thing for me to figure out, was that it's okay for me to not perform an update immediately, as long as I understood what that update or why there was a security release for this piece of code. So you can find out about security releases from a number of different sources. I find the best one to be following the security mailing list. Um, you just sign up for the mailing list. Anytime there's a, an announcement about a security flaw in one of the, either Drupal core or Drupal contrib, um, you'll get an email and it'll tell you. This can be a bit of a fire hose. Uh, Security announcements come out on Wednesday, and uh, like Wednesday afternoon, my inbox will fill up with security announcements. And then I go through it and I go, not using that module, not using that module, not using that module, not using that module, not using that module. Sweet, I'm done. Um, so, but it is important to go through and read them all and see if th it's a module that you're using or not. Drupal makes this easier by having a, a system that allows it to phone home and tell Drupal.org the list of modules that your site is using and, and which ones are enabled and which version of that module. 
uh, I would encourage you to turn this functionality on. And one of the things that I learned later was that um, you can actually have the system email you anytime there are updates to one of your modules, which is, is both really nice and can be really annoying. Um, we said that you know it's not Im always important to update right away, but if you don't update right away, your website will email you all the time telling you to update. And eventually, it's like the, um, the confirm page, right? You go to delete a user and it's like, are you sure you want to do this? And you're like, yes. And then you go to delete another one. It's like, are you sure you want to do this? Yes. And eventually you just like train your brain to click the confirm button. Um, I eventually just sort of trained my brain to delete the uh, update notifications that Drupal sends me and then realized, oh, that's probably not the best way to do it. Um, another way to get these, this information is following um, Drupal security on Twitter. Read these announcements and understand when I'm using the um, views module and there's a security release for that module, what is it actually fixing and does this apply to me and do I need to update right away or not? Uh, and those announcements contain a lot of information that, you know, they contain a severity level. Like this is highly critical that you update versus like, eh, if you get around to it, great. If you don't, you're not going to die. Um, and so understanding that, because a lot of times security issues aren't, aren't necessarily exploitable by the general public. Um, the majority of security issues end up being exploitable by someone that has a certain set of permissions on your site. And they generally relate to things like if you're an administrator and you can log into the site and you have this specific permission to view this page and you edit this field and enter this text into it, there's a security problem. If I'm the only person that can administer the site, um, I don't necessarily need to update the code right away. I just need to not go to that text field and type that stupid code into the field, uh, unless I want to verify that it is actually a problem, um, What you should do on your local development environment. But understanding that was important for me uh, because, like I said, I would kind of stress out and any security releases come out on Wednesday, so it was like Wednesday nights were totally a pain in the butt for me, and I would get all like, sweaty palms, are they going to send releases for something that I have to update? Because if they do, I've got like 10 sites that are using that module. Um, so you don't always have to update. However, updating usually isn't very hard either. Uh, so keeping that in mind, uh, if you've followed best practices, doing things like putting all of your code into the sites all modules directory or sites all themes, point releases for Drupal core tend to be really easy. Um, make a backup of your site. Download the copy of the new code and just replace all of the existing code with what you downloaded and run the update.php script and um, probably 99.9% .9 of the time everything works and you're done and that's it. Um, and so while you don't necessarily need to do them all right away, it's also important to remember that for the most part they're not very difficult. You need to test it though. Um, you can't just upload this code to your production site being like, hey, the Drupal community said this version of Drupal is going to be stable and work and it fixes all these problems. I'm going to upload it and put it on my site and oops. Um, again, local testing is very important with all of this stuff. Talking about updates, um, when I first started building Drupal sites, I learned about the ability to use the multi-site system, which was basically allowed you to create a bunch of sites that ran off of a single Drupal code base. Uh, by doing some fancy stuff with directory names inside of the sites directory, you can run a whole bunch of sites off a single Drupal code base, which is awesome because now I've only got one code base to maintain. And on Wednesdays when a new version of Drupal came out, all I had to do was update the code in that one spot and bam, all of my sites were updated. And it was really, really powerful. Um, and I used it a ton. And built more and more sites and it, for me it was like I've got one code base I'll just keep using it over and over for all of these sites and I kept adding more modules to the code base as different sites came along and I would need you know some modules for one and not for the other eventually I probably had like 20 plus sites running off of a single Drupal 5 code base um, and then there was an update to um, views at the time that was I, I believe it was a security update I don't remember for sure but there's an update that came out and I needed to update views. However, I had another module that I was using on probably like five or six of the sites that was totally broken by this update to views. 
Uh, but I didn't find out until like five weeks after I had updated because I just was like, oh, this is great. Um, I'll just install the new code and all of my sites will be up to date and secure and it's great. Um, and it turns out like five of these sites were sitting over there and half the pages on them didn't work and you couldn't get to it because there was some issue with another module that was relying on code that was in a prior version of views that no longer existed. And that site was broken. And it, I didn't really know. I kind of had this false sense of security that like, hey, they're all running off the same code base. I'll check the big ones. If they're still working, I can assume all the little ones are still working too. Apparently not really. And this got me to sort of this place where I understood that running all of my code or all of my sites off the same code base um, has some underlying challenges to it and updating is one of those. The implication here is that if you have a single code base, um, updating a module is updating all of those sites, but that's not necessarily always what you want to do. And there are ways around it. There's ways to say like, make this site in the multi-site install, use this copy of views, but everything else use this one. And I did that for a while, but then I got away from this being organized. All of a sudden I had a code base that had four different copies of views in it. Um, and it became even harder and harder to maintain. So multi-site is awesome and is really powerful, but before you make the decision to use it, it's important to understand how the system works and sort of what the box that you're going to be putting yourself into. If you're building a whole bunch of sites for like say a, a departments in a university where like every single one of the sites is exactly the same except for they maybe have a different theme, then yes, multi-site is a great tool for that. Um, if you're doing what I did, which was trying to figure out shortcuts to not have to um, update views on 20 different sites when there is a security release, multi-site is probably not the right answer for you because you're going to end up sort of in that whole same place that I did, which is some sites are ready to upgrade when others aren't. This becomes even more challenging when it's time for a, a core version upgrade or a major version upgrade. So going from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, this implies that I'm prepared to update every single one of my sites at the exact same time versus one at a time, which isn't necessarily true. Um, testing is really important. Um, and, and testing that the page on all of the sites works, not just on the three big ones, is also really important, uh, as I learned. And so I, I, I had that mistake where some of my sites would fail, kind of unknown to me, until the client sent me an email being like, oh, how come this doesn't work? And I'd be like, oh, apparently it hasn't been working for like five weeks, sorry. Um, so then I became like really strict about testing and I was like, I wrote tests for everything. Um, and then that sucked a lot of time and later I kind of refined this to be, uh, testing is important, um, but you really only need to test the things that need to work. Uh, which in some cases may be everything needs to work all the time. For me, it tends to be the things that are with this site, like if they fail, my business model is no longer working. Um, this is usually things like uh, if your site collects money um, or does anything with money, it's probably a good idea to test that system and make sure it works because if people can't give you their money, uh, your site isn't doing what it should be doing and you're not going to be able to write any more tests without more money. Um, I'd like to test anything that has to do with like user registration and sign up, especially if I've customized it in any way. Um, because if that breaks, I've essentially made it impossible for people to join my site or sort of interact with it. Um, if some link in the footer of my site for my privacy policy stopped working, um, it's A, very unlikely because that page is not very tightly coupled to anything else in the system. And B, it's not the end of the world if it's not working and somebody ends up having to send me an email uh, saying, hey, that's not working and I have to go solve the problem. So does it really make sense for me to spend all the time writing a test for that page? Probably not. Does it make sense for me to write a test to make sure that you can log into your account on the site? Yes, it probably does. There's a lot of tools for writing tests. Um, I initially um, wrote tests primarily using the simple test tool that is built into Drupal core. Um, and then later kind of realized that while this was good and allowed me to test a lot of things, there were easier ways to test the things that were important to me. Um, and I wasn't necessarily trying to do unit testing and make sure that this specific piece of code deep inside of Drupal worked. What I really needed to do was make sure that somebody could click on the pay me money now button. Um, so tools like Selenium 
um, or Casper, which are just sort of like glorified browsers that allow you to write a script that says, hey, I'm a user. I'm going to go through and click on this button. Was I able to do all those things, yes or no, um, are enough for that kind of testing. When you're testing your site, um, when you're first building it, when you're installing new modules and testing things, anytime you're testing things in Drupal, um, don't do your testing as user one or the, uh, the account that you created when you first installed your site. Because user one can do anything all the time in Drupal, um, you want to make sure you're using a different user other than user one because you want to make sure that all the permissions and security related stuff is actually working. Um, and so I ran into this a lot of times too, where I would like set up these complex workflows and I'd test it out as user one and I'd think it was, everything was working fine. Um, and then somebody else would tell me, yeah, I don't even see that button. I'd be like, oh, I see it, it's right there. And they'd be like, no, I swear it's not. And they'd send me a screenshot and finally I'd be like, oh, and log in as a user with editor permission, and I'd be like, yeah, totally. Your role doesn't have that permission. No wonder it's broken. Um, and if that doesn't work, clear the cache, because it's actually probably the cache that's the problem. Um, version control um, is actually really, really easy. Um, this is something that I didn't do for a long time. I was working, again, by myself. Uh, my version control system was rename the file to like um, node.module hyphen BAK, no dot module hyphen BAK hyphen one. Um, and it was just sort of rename all these files. Eventually, um, I started working with another person, and it was just the two of us. We still didn't use version control. Our version control system was the fact that we sat this far apart from each other, and I could say, Are you editing layout.css right now? And he'd say, No. I'm like, Okay, don't for a couple minutes because I'm going to make some changes. So he'd say, Yes, I am. And they'd be like, Oh, I'm going to send you an email with some changes. Can you paste them in there? Um, eventually, I was like, I should probably just figure out this version control thing. Turns out it's really easy. It's basically a giant undo button that lets you revert any stupid mistakes that you made. Um, it makes it really easy to collaborate with your coworkers. You can both work on the same file at the same time without having to be in the same room. It's awesome. Um, so take the time to learn version control. Version <laughs> control is only effective if everyone on the project is using it. So take the time to learn version control, and then take the time to locate all of your coworkers that aren't using version control and smack them. Um, if you're going to get into Drupal in any form, I suggest learning a little bit of PHP. You don't need to learn a lot, but the basics of PHP are pretty simple, and it helps. Um, well, you know, in Drupal, there's this idea that you know, yo, you could be a designer, and, and just all you have to do is modify CSS and HTML. And um, but the truth is, our template files still have a lot of PHP in them. And so, yes, you can do a lot without knowing PHP. You can do a whole lot more with just a rudimentary understanding of PHP. So take it some time to learn that. Even if your role is like project manager or something, taking time to learn a little bit about how the system works can change um, your value in that project considerably. Once you've learned PHP, um, stay far away from the PHP module. Um, before I, I knew about the views module, I used to create lists of content on my site by creating a new node and enabling the PHP filter and writing a bunch of SQL right into the body text area and then iterating over the results and printing out an unordered list right on the page. And I'd have like my blog page for my site. And you can do this with the PHP module. It allows you to basically type PHP right into a text field and then execute it uh, at runtime for that page. It works great. Um, the biggest problem that you're going to see is when it comes time to upgrade something. Um, you upgrade some code. You go to view a page. Nothing's working on the site. Your immediate assumption is it must be due to the fact that I updated the views module or whatever module I updated spend a ton of time trying to figure out why that module update doesn't work. You finally like try it on another site, and you're like, oh, it's flawless. It doesn't work. Um, I've run into this so many times I can't count where I can't view a page, I can't view a page. I'm getting a PHP error, but I don't know. It doesn't give me a line number or anything, because um, PHP run inside of an eval statement doesn't actually give you very good error reporting. Um, it r really gives you no error reporting. Um, and eventually, I would debug the problem to be it's a problem with some PHP code that was written into the body of this node. And the only way to fix it then is like go into the database and edit it directly in the database. And for me, it was delete that node or whatever so that I could actually get to the site. Um, 
So staying away from PHP module, even though it seems really nice and friendly, is actually going to be kind of a pain. Uh, once you learn some PHP, um, you probably have heard this before, don't hack core. Um, and the idea being don't modify the code in Drupal core, or really, you know, try to avoid modifying the code in Drupal contrib as much as possible. Um, this, for me, was one of those, like, I stuck to it religiously, um, to the point that I ended up writing this crazy module that I needed to be able to insert a link at the end of every menu that said, add another page here, but it had to be intelligent enough to know, like, should it add an article, or should it add a, you know, story, or whatever type of node. I ended up writing all this crazy code that registered some shutdown functions in PHP, which was a horrible idea, uh, that then like reparsed the entire menu system for the page and inserted these in. And it was like, this is great, it works, uh, except for it was really, really, really slow. Turns out I made a one line change in menu.module, and then I could just write like five lines of code and do what I needed to. And all of a sudden I was like, you know what, I am totally okay with hacking core if I need to. Um, so don't hack core is sort of that like don't you know avoid it if you can, but it's not like a religious don't ever do it. Um, you will come across occasions where you need to or it makes sense to, and feel free to do so. When you do, document it uh, and hopefully document it on Drupal.org. Oh, I'm kind of running out of time. I think I'm like out of time. Um, I read the theme function um, and this was actually in Drupal 5. I printed out a copy of the theme function like on physical paper and I read it on the bus one day on my commute to work uh, and all of a sudden I understood how Drupal's theme system worked way better. Um, it's, it's really, it's like 50 or 60 lines of code, most of it is comments that makes all of the theme system in Drupal work. It's totally worth just reading the code for this function. Um, filters affect permissions. So when you configure input filters on your um, site, you have the ability to do something like say turn on the PHP module and give administrators the permission to use the PHP filter. If I create a node that uses a filter that only specific roles have permission to um, use, only people that are in that role will be able to edit that um, node. And so an example of this is as the administrator, user one, I go and edit a story that someone else wrote on our blog, I changed the filter to be full HTML to do something, they come back, they only have the blogger role that doesn't have permission to use the full HTML filter. I've suddenly locked them out of being able to make any changes to that node. And this is something that bit me a lot early on. Uh, make sure you're running cron. Uh, cron does all kinds of things in Drupal, including like um, getting out, collecting all the information for the search index, uh, clearing out caches, and just sort of doing like garbage collection. Um, there's a lot of information in Drupal's readme.txt file about how to make sure that this is running um, and just make sure that it's running. Um, and then um, I talked a bit about testing and stuff. I like to try to automate that as much as possible. Um, and I like to, now that I've kind of figured out different tools like Selenium and so forth, um, making it so that when I do update a module, I don't have to go and click on every single site. Um, by automating things was a really useful thing to figure out. Drush makes that possible uh, in a lot of scenarios. If you're not familiar with it, Drush is the Drupal shell. Um, I avoided this for a long time because I was like, why would I need to use Drush? I mean, isn't Drupal just like a user interface on top of Drush? And I like user interfaces. Um, it turns out Drush is really handy. Um, you can just do things like type into your command line, download this module, and it'll download the module. Um, and instead of me having to go and download views and unpack it and put it into the sites all modules directory, Drush would just take care of that for me. I can enable modules with Drush. I can get status information about my site, which as you can tell, this one's really old. Um, and most importantly, I can clear the cache with Drush. Um, and this was cool because then I figured out my development environment could call Drush as well. So I could set it up to do things like whenever I save this file, automatically clear the cache so I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and then, um, yeah, see, I told you this is going to be a fire hose. Um, one of the things that happens with Drupal, and, and for me was sort of revolutionary in figuring it all out, was that. I would build all these complicated photo galleries by clicking together a bunch of views and content types and so forth. And then it was time to make changes to it because my client needed something different. So I'd try it all on my local development environment and I'd write down all the steps on the back of a napkin and then I'd go to my production environment and I'd try to replicate all those steps again. 
the idea of being able to take that configuration and export it into code. Um, Dries talked about this this morning, the configuration management initiative. Uh, but basically, the problem that is trying to be solved is taking this configuration that we've created, things like creating a view, and put it into code so that it can go into version control and can be easily deployed amongst um, your sites or your different environments. You can actually do a lot of this now in Drupal 7 using the features module. Uh, features basically takes a whole bunch of stuff on your site and it puts it into a meat grinder and you get something that sort of resembles a feature or a module or sort of resembles meat out the other end. Uh, and then you can take this code and check it into version control and, and deploy it between your sites. Um, and I'm really out of time, so I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides here. Two. This one. So this is important. Um, this, for me, was like, I, Drupal's open source. Um, it's licensed under the GPL license. Open source means a lot of different things. Um, to, and, and it means different things to different people. When I first got involved with Drupal, what it meant for me was Drupal is free. So was, this is awesome. I could download this for free and, and make a bunch of money building sites. Later, I realized that what it really meant was that I could read Drupal. Um, and this was like hugely influential in how much I learned about how Drupal worked. There was always this black box. And we sort of get used to building, you know, you build a site in like SharePoint or something. And you never really get to look at the code that powers it. So you never have a complete understanding of how the system works. Being able to do things like read the theme function, uh, like I cannot tell you how much I learned about Drupal from being able to do that and realize like, oh, I had no idea that you could name a template file using this cool like uh, naming convention and all of a sudden you know, you're overriding things in a different way until I was able to read the code. Um, so that's important to know. And then there's also, because it's open source, um, you can basically like copy and paste the code. So find code that somebody else is done most of what you need to do and copy and paste it and modify it to do what you need it to. That's a really great learning tool. As is contributing to Drupal. Uh, because it's open source, when you modify that code, you can contribute it back. And when you write 60 lines of code in order to write the word member or members and you upload a patch to drupal.org um, and then, you know, Quick Sketch comes along and says, hey, this is great. Thanks so much for contributing this code you could eliminate 20 lines of code from this by using this function. At first, I'm kind of like, oh, screw you, man. I would spent so much time figuring this code out. And then I was like, wow, I just learned a ton of information for free by the fact that I contributed this back. And somebody sort of, essentially, I got a free code review out of that um, and learned a bunch about how Drupal worked. I learned that there was such a thing as format underscore something functions in Drupal. I had been doing Drupal development for probably four years, and I didn't even know that those functions existed until someone told me about it. And I only got that because I was contributing back. Um, there's lots of opportunities to contribute. A good one um, this week will be the sprints on Friday. Um, so if you've never been to a, a sprint or a DrupalCon, or if you've ever wanted to like get involved and contribute back, um, Friday will be a really, really good opportunity to do that. There's a, sort of a sprint set up for people that haven't done this before and are interested in learning about the tools and how to get involved. Um, attend local user groups. Um, I was a Drupal developer for years before I started attending the Minneapolis user group. Um, turns out they're just a bunch of really cool people that like to do things like I do, like hang out at bars and drink beer and talk about Drupal. And they're actually really nice. And when I want to know like which module I should use to solve some particular problem, one of them has probably done it before and they could tell me which module to use. And most important, um, and the thing that took me a long time to sort of come to terms with, with Drupal is that there is no magic. Um, there's this idea that like I've downloaded Drupal, it's this black box, I can install it and, and sort of like, oh, I click all these buttons and something magically happens. Um, and I was okay with that for a while, but once I let myself say, there is no magic, I need to understand how and why this particular piece works, I really took my understanding of Drupal and, how, and all of that to uh, the next level, and so that was important for me. Whew. So that's my presentation, um, lots of information. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. So the question was more uh, detail on the difference between a node and an entity, um, which it can be a little bit confusing. Um, there, essentially, a node is a type of entity. So if you think of entities in Drupal as being sort of a shell that you can use in order to start adding collections of fields together to create some sort of source of data, and then one of those types of data sources that you're creating is a node. Um, a user is another example of something that's an entity. An entity in Drupal is anything that can have fields added to it. Um, so there's lots of examples of that. Nodes are a type of entity. Um, users are a type of entity. Taxonomy terms are a type of entity. The idea comes from in Drupal 6 with CCK, we had nodes and you could add fields to a node. And everyone was like, this is great and really powerful. I can add all these fields. And then they started trying to turn everything into a node. Like, let's make comments nodes. Let's make users nodes. Let's make taxonomy terms nodes. Let's make blocks nodes so that you could put fields on them. Because uh, the CCK was really powerful, is really powerful. And so Entities takes that concept and basically abstracts it one level further. Um, so now you can have things or entities that you can put fields onto, and then you create um, bundles of those entities that become like a node type. So a, um, you know, the page node type is a bundle uh, of fields on an entity. Uh, it also gives us the ability to have a, um, a more abstract system for dealing with all the data that gets, you add a field to a node, uh, you add a field to a user, the code that runs in the background that performs things like saving that to the database or removing the value, we can have that all be um, encapsulated in the entity system rather than having to rewrite it for each individual system. Um, but basically, the hierarchy is you've got sort of this concept of entities, which in themselves aren't really that useful. Like they're really useful for from a developer perspective for writing code, it, it's basically simplifying the ability to do something like create the node system, which uses fields, uh, which exposes things to views and all of that, and same with users and so forth. Does that help clarify it a little? It's a little 